Uh, welcome again uh, to this Zoom event called Clean Energy Revolution, What's the Next Big Step? Uh, this evening, we'll discuss the growth of the clean energy industry, challenges of transmission and interconnection, the solutions to end hampering bottlenecks, and what we can do to make a difference. Don't worry if you miss anything. We're recording, and we'll send the recording to everyone who RSVP'd. My name is Quentin Scott, and I'm the Federal Policy Director here at Chesapeake Climate Action Network and CCAN Action Fund. As most of you know, CCAN's federal team pulled out all the stops to do its part in 2021 and 2022 to pass our nation's first climate bill in the form of the Inflation Reduction Act. Uh, one month ago today, actually, uh, on August 12th, we marked the one-year anniversary of our historic accomplishment. I can't thank the folks on this call and others for attending our rallies on the National Mall, the countless phone calls to West Virginians, and all the other actions that we took to make sure that our dream of a climate bill never went away. The fruits of our labor have already paid dividends. Uh, since the signing of the Inflation Reduction Act, over 211 clean energy project, projects have been announced across 38 states, cre creating over 170,000 new jobs. This is truly a clean energy re revolution, or so we're hoping. So far, countless clean energy projects across America have faced challenges with grid transmission, interconnection, and siting. The clean energy re revolution is at risk of being stopped right in its tracks, and we cannot let that happen. We have an obligation to see this through so we can take the next big step in this revolution. We're gonna quickly play a video that illustrates why we need to take that next step. The state of Vermont has one of the greenest grids in the U.S. Two-thirds of their electricity comes from renewable energy sources, like solar, wind, or hydroelectric plants. The current goal is to be at 75% by 2032, which is why it was pretty surprising when a new solar project here was denied. This area doesn't have a lot of people, but it does have plenty of potential for renewable energy. The power plants here, in addition to a regular power supply from Canada, already put about 450 megawatts of electricity onto the grid. And by grid, I mean these power lines. But the grid's capacity is around 450 megawatts. So the grid just wouldn't be able to handle any more power generated here. If we want a greener future in the US, we'll need to build more renewable energy plants. But to actually use that electricity, We'll also need to build more of these. Well, there you have it. Uh, that is a quick summary of what we are going to be talking about tonight. I can imagine you've heard a lot of different proposals from the various things related to permanent reform, uh, what's in or what wasn't in the debt ceiling bill uh, that was agreed upon uh, earlier this year, uh, what the Federal Energy Regulatory Commission can do and can't do, there's so much out there and it probably has your head spinning. Uh, this evening, we're gonna simplify it for you so we can have a straightforward, simple demand of our elected officials. Uh, tonight, you'll hear from Dr. Rowe, who will give an overview of the moment we're in. Uh, you'll also hear from Russell Armstrong, who will break it down from the climate justice perspective. Then Harry Godfrey, who will tell us what's happening at the Department of Energy and what the Federal Energy Regulatory Commission can do despite a 2-2 split. And finally, you will hear from CCAN's own Ernesto Villasenor, who will lay out what CCAN has been doing and why we need to win this moment. At this point, if you have any questions, please drop uh, those questions in the Q&A function, uh, and we'll get to those questions uh, later uh, in the program. Uh, but first up, let's bring up uh, Dr. Deborah Rowe, who serves as president of the U.S. Partnership for Education for Sustainable Development, which convenes and nurtures uh, faculty's actions for climate mitigation, adaptation, a just clean energy transition, and sustainable development goals at a global scale. Dr. Rowe owned retail and wholesale energy efficiency and solar companies, and then taught renewable energies and energy management 
the sustainable development and related topics for 40 years. I can go on and on about all the accomplishments of Dr. Rowe. Uh, enough to say she is super qualified and we're so glad to have her on with us tonight. Take it away, Dr. Rowe. Thank you. Another way of saying that is that I'm just super old, right? So I've been around for a long time doing this work. I'm really glad to be with you today and to be able to share these thoughts with you. So let's get started, okay? So the future of clean energy, a just clean energy transition depends on reducing project delays. If we look at the deployment of renewables, and the last year's American Clean Power Association's annual report, we actually have a decrease in clean energy installation for the first time in five years. And we should be increasing every year instead. Yes, it's still one of the three highest years for annual installations. But if we keep deploying renewable energies at this rate, not only would we not meet President Biden's goal, but we would not meet the scientific um, standards that have been set for what we need to do to take our last shot here at stabilizing climate or at least reducing the worst impacts of climate change. So <clears throat> it's so important that we handle whatever's holding us back. So let's look at that. The delays played a significant role in the decrease in clean energy deployment in the last couple of years. And according to that same organization, at the end of 2021, there was 11 gigawatts that experienced delays. Now, more than half of those have come online. But in contrast, in 2022, out of 66 gigawatts that were delayed, 53 gigawatts were unable to come online. This is a much higher percentage. And so I work with a number of groups, particularly in this case, I want to speak to the young adults who are here tonight from Change the Chamber Lobby for Climate. They were asked to go to the White House to celebrate the, the passage of the uh, climate provisions in the Inflation Reduction Act. And while I was waiting on the White House lawn for this to start, I was talking to a number of experts, including some um, industries that are very involved with clean energy deployment. And I said, what do you see as the number one roadblock? And they said, it's the delays. It's the delays in the interconnection. So let's keep going because we're going to get to the solutions here. Now, there are three main reasons for these delays. The first is that we have a shortage of transmission lines. And so you can't connect the projects to the grid if the grid's not there. The second is permitting issues. They are just taking too long. And the third is supply chain constraints, which we know hit many industries, but is a particular concern here. So there was some permitting reform in the debt limit bill, which is good news, and Biden signed that, President Biden, in early June. That speeds up the review process, but it does not significantly address the other challenges of transmission, interconnection, and siting. So we have to deal with those. And as of last December, more than 2,000 gigawatts of electricity sit in the interconnection queue of those 95% are the clean energy and battery storage projects. Look, our interconnection process that we've had for decades was designed for a few centralized fossil fuel plants. But now we have all of these distributed, smaller renewable energy projects coming online. And so we need to change the process. Business as usual is dysfunctional. And the average interconnection costs are higher for the wind, solar, and storage than for natural gas because you also have to upgrade the network oftentimes. Bottom line too, we need more transmission lines. So do you realize that as of last year, only 675 miles of new high voltage transmission lines were built? And that was a drop of 50% from the year before. So we're really getting stuck here and we need to get unstuck. So what can we do? Anybody who knows me knows that I only focus on systems changing solutions. We've got to update regulations. You know, we're involved with this solutions for pollution where we're updating regulations in lots of different parts of the federal government. And here it applies as well. FERC is known as the Federal Energy Regulatory Commission. And this is the group 
that has to change business as usual. They've already taken initial steps to streamline the interconnection process. They finalized some rules that include, let's not approve them one at a time, let's improve them in clusters, let's have firm deadlines. And if a <clears throat> transmission provider doesn't complete their studies on interconnection, there should be penalties if they miss their date. We also need to update the modeling, the performance requirements. But to build on these new rules, do you see how this is in red? Yes, because these are the things that you can help with, right? FERC should and could establish clear cost allocation me mechanisms. You know, who's going to pay for it? How's it set up? It's got to be based on a defined set of benefits that transmission provides to the region. FERC could also establish and should establish a fair long-term regional transmission cost allocation method and not have it be so, dare I say, loosey-goosey about who's going to pay for what. And then um, finally, require transmission planners to make those long-term reliability assessments of the energy mix, including the scenarios where we have high usage of renewables, because that's what we need to do to meet the science-based targets. So FERC can do this, and it'll make a big difference. There are additional solutions. FERC could require planners to consider non-wires alternatives. That means instead of using um, new grid, to use the existing electric line infrastructure more efficiently so you don't have to build and you don't need the new capital. Reducing the need for new transmission can help avoid environmental and community impacts that can delay project permitting. But be aware that this is just part of the solution. We are going to need some more transmission lines. And also to develop a long-term roadmap for expanding high-voltage transmission needs at this rate of 2.3% a year, we want to increase at this historic rate. Similar, you know, we've done it before in the 70s and 80s, because we need to do that to meet our clean energy goals, our how do we prevent massive human suffering goals. And to update our interconnection requirements, we want to reflect the latest technologies. We want to avoid unnecessary costs for retrofits and upgrades because we didn't do it right the first time round this year, next year, beyond. So what can you do to make this difference? Well, you can ask your members of Congress, go ahead and call them up. And it's particularly what we wanna to get to the House Energy and Commerce Committee members and the Senate Energy and Natural Resources Committee members, but you can call whoever your representatives are and ask them to weigh in with those committees to ask FERC to finalize a strong transmission planning and cost allocation rule. That's the phrase, write it down. To finalize a strong transmission planning and cost allocation rule. And then contact the Biden administration itself, the White House, right? And FERC directly to urge these further actions. Also, there's public comment periods that are coming up to support the updating of FERC policies. And your host tonight will share information on the public comment periods with everybody who's registered today. So please do make public comments. Our young adults do. They find it to be very rewarding and to make a difference. I do wanna tell you that I have so many examples over the decades that I've been doing this work. I had three students change the vote of a senator on a very important solar bank bill. Just three students made three phone calls. So don't think that you getting involved won't make a difference. It can make a big difference. And for more information, uh, people are dropping some emails into the chat for you. And so you can contact them if you want more information um, that we haven't covered. So that's what I've got for you. And now back to you all and your next speaker. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Rowe. Uh, before we move on to the next speaker, I just want to ask you one quick question. Uh, mm -hmm. You know, when I'm speaking to you know uh, developers in solar and wind, uh, one thing that they consistently say to me is like they don't know what the rules are for connections, or they don't know what it's going to cost, and so there's just a lot of questions for them. Can you talk about really quickly how important certainty is for them to you know really be aggressive with their projects? 
Sure. So, you know, I used to own a solar and energy management firm, right? Retail and wholesale. And when our costs are uncertain, then we are uncertain about what we can do. And so this could cause project developers to say, I'm not going to do more. You have such a roadblock right now, such a bottleneck of projects that aren't getting connected. We don't get our money until things are connected, right? We don't start to see the production of the energy. And that feeds into our overall financial plan. So it's very important, this certainty, to have it be reliable. Project developers can count on it. Financiers can count on it. It's crucial for moving forward. Thank you, Dr. Rowe. Okay, uh, moving on to our next speaker, uh, I'd like to bring up uh, Russell Armstrong, uh, who is the policy director for uh, climate and environment uh, at Hip Hop Caucus. He works on federal policy that provides climate justice and environmental justice for marginalized communities most impacted by climate change and institutional racism. Prior to Hip Hop Caucus, Russell focused on climate justice as a senior policy advisor uh, for uh, Oxfam. There, he focused on domestic advocacy for stop fossil fuel expansion, as well as increasing international climate financial uh, commitments. Uh, my favorite thing about uh, Russell is that he went to Loyola University in Chicago, where I'm from. Uh, so I'm glad that you spent some time uh, in Chicago. Uh, why don't you take it away from there, Russell? No, <clears throat> thank you for that introduction. Um, actually, so just to give a little background, the Hip Hop Caucus uh, and now my new role is the Senior Director for Campaigns and Advocacy. We actually work at the intersection of multiple issues focused on environmental justice, but also economic justice, civil and human rights, and democracy reform in terms of voting. We think all of those things are valuable and important, particularly for Black and BIPOC communities that are usually uh, pushed out of the process for environmental justice and for owning their own uh, the ability to engage in this process. And I think that's the thing that turns off a lot of people from being engaged in the political process. They've seen too many times where it does not benefit their own communities. And you can say the same thing here in when it comes to transition and clean energy. Um, we recently, we also have a podcast that we do called The Coolest Show. And recently we've been having a series focused on highlighting executives, particularly Black executives in the administration who are working on environmental justice. The last two people that we had in the episode that just aired today was Jahi Wise, who is over the Greenhouse Gas Reduction Fund and formerly at the White House as a senior advisor on climate, and also with Shalanda Baker, who is at the Department of Energy, who owns a lot of the work in terms of ensuring that environmental justice moves forward and was focused on the idea of revolutionary power. So one of the things I want to highlight today is just that there are opportunities for individuals to get engaged, which Dr. Rose started to hit on, but there are outside opportunities to engage with these agencies that are overseeing uh, transmission and basically the transition to clean energy. For example, with FERC, the Federal Energy Regulatory Commission, they have an office, a new office that's been established called the Office of Public Participation. That office is actually right now soliciting feedback on ways that they can do better in terms of doing outreach and providing videos uh, to people about how to engage in the stakeholder process so that they can make legal comments on these issues that come before them about transmission. Because the only way that uh, comments get seen is that someone that you have to become seen as essentially a official stakeholder in that process and by commenting on it. And then you have a stake in terms of they have to respond and engage with you. The commissioners of FERC have to respond and engage with you. Right now, that agency is kind of locked up in a bottleneck and because of they've lost their uh, because they lost the commissioner and the administration has not put forward a new commissioner to kind of break the tie between the existing commissioners. Um, with that concern, there's also issues with it being a rubber stamp for things like LNG and fossil fuel projects, which are tied to the transmission lines in the clean energy you know, um, revolution that we need to see to get to one our both our global goals when we're talking about NRDCs, which, which relate to, I mean, NDCs, nationally determined contributions that apply to the Paris Agreement that many folks may have heard of about greenhouse gas uh, emissions, both nationally and globally, and also just with engagement in terms of just how the Gulf South has been turned into essentially a sacrifice zone 
over the past few decades because of the proliferation of projects happening there. So that's one way to get engaged. Another way that like individuals have gotten engaged is through either their own like uh, ability to organize themselves. So there's a campaign that I work with in my role with US Can um, called Arm in Arm. And so they led a, an organization, they led a campaign called a Power for a Southern People, not a Southern Company campaign. And part of that was focused on ensuring that what had happened and was highlighted during the pandemic was how utility companies have utilized like shutoffs and uh, things like that to pass on a uh, cost to customers and then cut off customers who then couldn't pay for their own utility bills. And this ties directly into the fact that if we push for more clean energy options, it's been shown by numerous examples that in the long run, and in some ways in the not so long run, in the short term, they're gonna lower energy costs significantly for end users and also provide an ability for end users to actually be able to feed back into the market. However, the monopolies in some of these states, such as with Southern Power in Georgia, Mississippi, in Georgia, Alabama, places like that, where they they don't have the ability to have direct competition. Clean energy groups don't have the ability to have direct competition in these spaces. It hinders our ability to move forward, and so that's why we need things such as the Office of OPP at FERC. We need the plans such as what the Department of Energy has been working on across the, making sure that there's a, a streamlined process for transmission across federal lands. And that's why we need folks to engage in processes, particularly when there's uh, collections of CDFIs and other mon nonprofits and monetary uh, organizations to engage with processes like the Greenhouse Gas Reduction Fund, which is the first of its kind, essentially a uh, green bank fund $27 billion for three competitions, one of which is for, focused on solar, but the other two are focused more on getting funds into nonprofits who can then turn that around into companies who are locally focused on making sure that there is clean energy development in communities that also ties into concerns around Justice 40, which is the focus of the administration on ensuring that benefits of the IRA and other programs from the government get down to environmental justice communities. So those are some ways that folks can engage more thoroughly in this process by making sure that we get to the clean energy revolution that we want to see. Thank you, Russell. Uh, just one quick question before we move on. Uh, we all know we need to accelerate pretty quickly uh, to meet our goals, uh, but some say that uh, we have to reduce community uh, review process and letting the community weigh in because that's creating the bottleneck. But we know that partially is not true. Uh, so how would you, how do we maintain uh, a robust uh, community uh, involvement process that protects communities, number one, and protects our ecosystems while also accelerating? Well, one of the issues with the process is that companies try to get around uh, community engagement in the first place. And then that's when their plans get slowed up is because they never engaged thoroughly in the first place. They submitted environmental and impact assessments that were inaccurate or didn't actually assess what was going on on the ground level. Um, and then agencies themselves determine that there are no significant impacts to these communities and communities have no choice but to pose legal action to try and ensure, act, to ensure that there's delays or that there's a way for them to have a say in the process. Most of those delays that we see aren't actually through permitting reform and they're not due to local communities trying to have a say in these processes. And so that's a myth that has been used to try and tackle permitting reform and take down permitting reform in Congress. And I think a better way of doing it is for agencies to become more proactive about their engagement. And so we've seen that start to happen in this administration. I'm not giving them like an A plus or like a uh, you know green stick gold star for it, but they've definitely been doing better than previous administrations have done in terms of trying to actively engage with communities about this whether it's through, like I said, the Office for Public Participation, through having more um, outreach through things like uh, the PR100 uh, campaign that the Department of Energy has been focused on in terms of engaging uh, folks, whether it's in Puerto Rico and at Juntas or other places that are trying to experiment with microgrids. And so more of that needs to happen on the front end where they're being serious about getting 
um, generators and developers to say like, what is the actual impacts and being straightforward and upfront about it. And that is what's going to actually help us move faster and get to the clean energy revolution with fewer delays that we want to see happen. Absolutely, Russell. Couldn't agree with you more. Thank you. Up next, uh, we have uh, Harry Gottfried, uh, who is uh, leads Advanced Energy United's Federal Investment and Manufacturing Working Group uh, with experience in industry, federal government, and academia. Harry played a pivotal role in the passage of the Virginia Clean Economy Act. Bravo. We're at CCAN. We love that bill. Uh, before arriving at Advanced Energy United, Harry worked at in Inventory <laughs> O Power, where he developed expertise in renewable generation, energy efficiency. Uh, he previously held positions in the White House Office of Legislative Affairs and Office of Majority Whip James Clyburn. Uh, thank you for joining us, Harry. Quentin, thank you so much for having me. Great audience tonight. Really glad to be here. I'm going to spend just a couple of minutes sort of laying out what's happening in Washington right now and really drilling in around you know, large scale transmission, because this is really one of the choke points we talked about. I think Deborah previewed it really well with her initial presentation and slides. And then we heard about some of the community engagement challenges that we're facing all of these projects. And that that's really an important part of the conversation on permitting reform from Russell. I want to take it sort of two steps back. First, just a little bit more about Advanced Energy United. We're a trade association represents a cross section of the clean energy community. So we represent folks who are building large scale as well as distributed energy systems, work in the efficiency and demand response spaces, likewise transportation electrification and large corporate buyers who are concerned about their sustainability footprints and working to make certain that they can meet their own sustainability standards as well. Um, for all of these groups and more, permitting reform, to accelerate transmission build out matters. And it should matter for everybody. And I wanna give three quick stats as to why this matters so much. It matters in terms of resilience, it matters in terms of practical economics, and it matters in terms of emissions. So from a resilience standpoint, the United States needs a grid that's bigger than the weather. For contrast, imagine if even today, each individual state, and in some cases, subparts of states are responsible for roads. So I'm sorry, I got to the border between Virginia and Maryland, and the road stops, and then we just figure out something else. They're like, can you possibly imagine what that would look like? We can build a, bit, a grid that's bigger than the weather, but we actually need to interconnect the grids we have in order to go about doing that. The ramifications of not doing that are really clear. Two years ago, winter storm Uri in Texas knocked out the power to 11 million folks, and it caused hundreds of deaths. Had Texas been better interconnected into the regions around it, there was power there that they could have utilized. Fewer people would have had blackouts, and we could have avoided deaths. So that's practical resilience. Economics. Grid congestion means that we're paying more for power because the most affordable forms of power aren't able to actually reach, reach the places where they are in demand. Last year alone, US consumers paid 21 billion on their energy bills due to grid congestion. So like, doesn't matter whether you care about advancing clean energy or not, just from a, we should be saving dollars and cents, we need more transmission build out, we need it faster, we need it yesterday. And then from clean energy targets. So, I think everybody's familiar with the stats and the projections around, you know, post the passage of the IRA, the United States is now on track to go about actually reducing emissions from its power sector by about 40% by 2050. Still not reaching sort of our full scale goals, but a, a significant and market reduction takes us well there. But additional projections indicate if we don't actually solve the riddle of transmission and interconnection, we could miss out on up to 80% of those savings. So it is a huge barrier. So in just a couple of minutes, let me run through really quickly what Congress, the Department of Energy, and FERC are tackling and where some of the sort of key points are that sort of serve to be challenges. So the IRA and the bipartisan infrastructure law had some really important policy and some dollars as well in order to go about tackling that. That was a good start. When it comes to dollars, we need orders of magnitude more if we're actually going to really do the sort of transmission build out that we're talking about here. The bipartisan infrastructure law also provided FERC with federal backstop siting authority so that they could actually permit high voltage transmission lines when states couldn't go about doing so. 
We'll talk about where that stands in a minute here when we talk about FERC. And yes, the debt ceiling deal did have a, a, a little bit of work around permitting reform, some work for CEQ that was good. There was a, a study in there. You know, there's a little bit of a debate about whether or not that study actually moves the ball forward or actually serves as a delaying mechanism. When we, we've done a lot of studies, we know the problems, we need to tackle these issues. But at least there was a nod in that direction. So we'll talk a little bit more about that. There are at least three big things that Congress, maybe even four, that Congress still can be doing to tackle these issues. One of them is a transmission in ITC. This is similar to the tax credits that are used for solar or storage, other clean energy resources. It reduces the cost of transmission build out. This was left on the cutting room floor during IRA negotiations. And if we're being really honest, there's not a near term prospect for this to move forward. We see a tax bill in years ahead. Clean energy advocates should really consistently be pushing to include this because it would change the economics on these projects and make them easier from a private sector development and capital investment standpoint. FERC authority for interstate transmission siting. There's some authority that's already there, but it could be clarified. It could be strengthened to a greater extent. The Site Act that's been introduced by Congressman Quigley in the House and uh, Senator Whitehouse in the Senate would actually move us in the right direction around that. TBD on the prospect for that during this term. Inter-regional transfer requirements. This basically means, you know, our grid is broken out into states and regions across the country, ensuring that between those regions, there's sort of a minimum ability to transfer a certain amount of power between that. That could have a real impact on actually reducing the congestion and that economic loss that we we're talking about at the outset. Um, there's There's been legislative work done on this. The Big Wires Act is actually going to advance this idea. Folks should keep an eye out for that. I think we're going to see some action around that here very soon. Um, so keep an eye on the headlines uh, for, for additional news around that bill. This was briefly discussed during those debt ceiling negotiations uh, a little while ago, um, but ultimately didn't make it in there. So opportunities for additional congressional action. You know, we're entering a season where it's a little more campaign focused. So that reduces it. The fourth congressional action is not actually a, um, a piece of legislation. It's an appointment. As Quentin, you mentioned at the top, there's a 2-2 split at FERC right now. There's one Democratic appointee. That seat is currently vacant. That seat, filling that seat would allow FERC to actually make more robust moves in terms of regional transmission planning and cost allocation that Deborah talked about earlier on. I think moving to sort of find a strong resolution there that's a really key opportunity. And without a 3-2 um, sort of full FERC there, a little harder to see how that gets resolved. So too, a rule around federal backstop siting authority. Yes, the bipartisan infrastructure law allows for that, but actually they need to actually establish a rule to determine exactly how that'll work. Um, right now, at least FERC's 2-2 split might be holding that back. So actually seeing an appointee at FERC, I think that's really promising. We did see Senator Manchin last week put forward a name to actually sort of start moving this process forward. That's promising. That would be a Democratic nominee. We would need to see that person repair, likely paired with a Republican nominee to move this forward as, uh, as Commissioner Danley. Technically, his term expired in July. He could sit on the commission to the end of the year. So TBD on that, exactly how that gets resolved is... is a, a dynamic worth watching, but more action at FERC. And I think I'd reinforce all the points Deborah made around that. Finally, I'd note DOE has really been undertaking some notable actions. The bipartisan infrastructure law, IRA had dollars in there to tackle those issues. Transmission siting and economic development authority, this is headed up by the grid deployment office, $760 million there for states to actually improve how they're doing transmission, how they're doing the regulatory and siting process these for these, making certain the communities go about benefiting from that. They just announced that funding opportunity at the end of August. It's gonna be open for states, tribes, and localities until the end of October. Encourage your states to apply for those dollars, to get involved in that process, to actually tackle that. And then one final quick rulemaking authority, DOE is working to actually go about coordinating interact agency transmission authority and permits program. They put forward a rulemaking process, a NOPER, a notice of proposed rulemaking back in August. Comments are due on that in October. You'll see us 
comment around that and say we're really encouraged to see that move forward. But there's a lot more to be done there as we sort of continue moving forward. So there's a lot of action happening inside the Beltway right now to move these things. But the urgency around it is really key if we want to save lives, strengthen our economy, and meet our emissions goals. So thanks for the opportunity to talk about this. Putting back over to you. Thank you, Harry. Um, as we know, and you mentioned that these commissioners are really important at FERC. Uh, so let's say uh, somehow the process gets you know uh, bogged down over the next uh, several months. Uh, what happens at the end of this year when that uh, one commissioner spot is has some mandatory, uh, I guess he has to uh, resign mandatorily. So what happens in January? Yeah, so I mean, Quentin, it's a great question. Conceivably, he has to roll off. I think there's a little bit of sort of legal uncertainty or ambiguity about him being forced off the commission at that point. But ostensibly, you would then have a 2-1 commission with a Democratic majority, at least through that year, you would actually have a, you know, you would have the ability to move forward on that. Does a 2-1 commission really feel like it's empowered to make far-reaching rules? I think that's a larger question. I, you know, I'm not a, I'm not a mind reader when it comes to how Chairman Phillips, Commissioner Clemens, Commissioner Christie are thinking around that. I think they would take a somewhat more cautious approach. But again, I'm not saying what they ought to do. I'm just sort of saying, I think they might be a little cautious in that scenario. A, a three-person commission when really it needs to be five, it's it's dicey territory. Understood. So basically we need this to happen. Uh, yeah. To that point, uh, we're gonna take immediate action on this. Uh, if you look in the chat, uh, we have a tweet that we want you to copy and paste and send out right now. Uh, we wanna see that fifth commissioner uh, appointed to FERC, and we need the Senate Energy and Natural Resources Committee to do that. So copy and paste, tweet that out right now uh, so we can get a little tweet storm going this evening. Uh, so uh, when they come into the office tomorrow morning, they'll see uh, there are 77 participants. They need to see 77 tweets uh, when they come into the office tomorrow morning so they know uh, this is what we need. All right, I am trusting that everyone is copying and pasting and sending out that tweet on the honor system here. All right, uh, moving on to our next speaker and uh, our very own Ernesto Villasenor, uh, who has uh, been with us uh, here at CCAN for several months. Uh, he had firsthand experience uh, understanding the effects of injustice, inspiring him to dedicate himself to the cause of social justice with over 10 years of experience in community organizing and legislative advocacy. He has worked tirelessly to ensure frame farm workers in California received overtime pay via legislation. He's advocated for local and state reproductive justice rights. Uh, he is now advocating for climate justice rights. Uh, he recently graduated from law school uh, being the first generation Latino, uh, Ernesto received, uh, like I said, his law degree from the University of Baltimore. Uh, and during his time there, he was the president of the Environmental Law Society and Students for Public Interest. Uh, Ernesto, I'm glad to welcome you to the stage. Uh, my good friend, take it away. Appreciate it. Thank you so much for having me. So one of the things that, well, amongst the many things that we've been doing here at Just Speak Climate Action Network, um, especially as it revolves around our energy grid and shifting and pushing for that green energy revolution, is really advocating and pushing for positive energy reform and positive transmission reform and permitting reform um, in Congress, as mentioned by Harry Gottfried, as mentioned um earlier by Russell Armstrong, um, amongst the many things that we've been pushing for is ensuring a robust environmental reviews and early community engagement with one um, with one of those being supporting the representative Donald McEachin Environmental Justice for, Act, um, Justice for All Act, which would consider cumulative impacts and involve environmental justice communities in the decision-making process. Um, when we look at permitting reform, when we look at pushing for any policy or reforms um, 
especially with everything that's been going on. We really want to incorporate and include um, the environmental justice and the frontline communities who are going to be impacted um, at the front lines when it comes to a lot of these permits um, and the reforming and the streamlining of these procedures. Um, and it also to increase funding for federal and state agencies um, who are performing these environmental reviews and to accelerate the renewable energy transition. Um, as, as we know, um, environmental reviews take a long time. They cost a lot of money. And we've seen the EPA and a lot of state um, environmental agencies struggling with, ha um, with having the necessary funding to provide um, to conduct robust environmental reviews while putting the communities at the forefront and also to, to suspend fossil fuel approvals. Um, as mentioned earlier, we've seen with HR, um, HR1, kind of advocating and pushing for fossil fuel projects. Um, as we look at modernizing and shifting towards a green energy revolution in our, and what our energy grid system should look like, we need to put a pause and a stop to a lot of the fossil fuel, um, a lot of the fossil fuel energy that's going into our grid. We need to start advocating and pushing for new projects that are actually replacing um, fossil fuel and making making it much more feasible for renewables to get adapted and get plugged into our grid system. Um, one of the great thing, one of the things that we've dealt with in the past couple of years, and a great example of this is Texas. We've seen the grid system um, failed at in extreme heat and in extremely and in extreme cold weather. And one of the things that we need to do is encourage the integration of Texas into the national grid, um, which also too would A, modernize the grid and adapt to those climate um, issues that we've been seeing throughout the US and that have been kind of testing the limits of our grid system. But then even also too, we've seen te um, Texas being a major um, hub for renewable energy, especially wind energy. And that and integrating Texas into the national grid um, will allow for significant renewable um, energy capacity growth. And then also to um, advocating for the creation of a federal agency planning agency that streamlines that energy approval process and prioritizes distributed energy resources and projects on degraded lands. Um, these are just some of the like few and many things that we've been doing. Um, at the federal level, but then even also to, um, we really want to um, advocate and push for clean energy permitting. Um, we really want to prioritize clean energy being plugged into our grid system and making, not necessarily reducing or making it easier for these projects in the sense of weakening our current um, permitting and reviews, but making it much more effective and efficient for these clean energy projects to go through these permitting processes. Um, our permitting reform, our permitting right now for a project to go through could take upwards to seven, eight years. A good example of this is, especially if you live around the DC area, um, just Union Station in DC, just for it to get that um, facelift that it's going through right now has been going on since at least 2014, 2015. And it's still going to take about two to three more years for that final permit to be granted. So, um, and that's just a good, that's just an example of what it looks like with permitting reform and getting those secured and necessary permits. Um, it, it's definitely gonna take a little bit longer for energy projects, um, and especially with uh, the grid, with, when we're looking at grids, when we're looking at transmission siding, we definitely want to streamline and make it much more faster, much more efficient for transmission line projects, especially at the state level, um, so that they could get more streamlined and get in faster. Thank you, Ernesto. Uh, just so folks know, we are working to uh, enable the chat uh, so everyone can uh, copy uh, and paste uh, the tweet. We apologize for that technical glitch. Uh, but let's get to some of the questions uh, that we are receiving. Uh, and so this is a question uh, maybe to both Harry and Dr. Rowe. Uh, 
Are there successful examples or best practices from other regions or even countries that could be used as a model for improving transmission planning and coordination? Maybe Harry, you want to take a shot at that? Sure. I, I, just a couple of quick items that you know certainly we have we've advocated for and th thinking about this. One of them is. Oftentimes you'll see sort of multi-step or multi-agency review processes for developments and projects. And, I mean, and this can be true of almost any type of project, but certainly projects uh, that have a large geographic footprint to them. Um, and so have a, sort of a disparate set of potential impacts. Make certain that there's a lead agency. So there's somebody who's actually responsible. In the process to say, has this been done? Has this been done? How so that there's there's one point of contact there. That's really important for project developers to have certainty, but also for somebody that really have ownership and clarity of removing that forward. And so consolidating that and then being able not to do those sequentially, but to do them simultaneously. So we're able to actually accelerate the process of permitting without necessarily removing important permitting, you know, steps and procedures. I do think that, and this was part of what the um, what the White House proposed. We didn't even talk about this, but the White House and the um, Council on Environmental Quality came forward with a set of NEPA um, proposals uh, recently, and one of them was to think about the the cumulative impacts and not just the negative cumulative impacts that can occur from these projects, but positive cumulative impacts as well. You know, any project, any development is going to have impacts. Whether those are de minimis or not is one of the things that gets assessed in the environmental impact process. But what is the long-term ramification if this transmission line gets built, if this solar project gets built, and that allows us to make the transition to 100% clean and move away from status quo fossil fire generation assets, that's a net positive impact for the climate. Taking that into account as we ultimately weigh there may be net negative impacts, but how do we net that out? I think cumulative impact assessment is really important in that process and thinking about that. So encouraged to see that. And then, you know, just thinking about what sort of reasonable timelines and limitations can we put so at some point we can actually move to a decision. Even if the decision is this project shouldn't move forward, that sort of certainty, this goes all the way back to what Deborah was talking about. The sort of certainty to say yes or no on a project allows the capital markets at the outset to say, I know at some point I'm going to have a res resolution and maybe I lose my shirt, more odds on I'm actually going to win on this, but at least I'll know keeping me in deadlock really isn't going to work effectively. It actually discourages investment and stifles this sort of, this sort of development. So those are a few ideas. Thank you, Harry. Uh, Dr. Rowe, uh, there are We've talked about a lot of proposals uh, tonight. Uh, there are even more out there. If there is one thing that we could prioritize for Congress or FERC, what would that one thing to do immediately? Well, the one thing to do immediately is keep your eye on the prize of getting rid of this roadblock. And I, I don't wanna say just pass this updated regulation or just appoint this person to the commission. Because the truth is they need to do a lot of things. We are at a crucial moment in the history of human beings. I have young adults who turn to me every day and say, Deborah, I am not sleeping at night because adults are not acting like adults and they are ruining my future. And so what I would say is don't just do one thing. Do everything that you can to move this forward because to be sitting at the White House and hearing that this is the number one roadblock. And all of us who have worked so hard to try to create an inclusive clean energy future, this is this is fixable, these items, right? This is something we can actually move on. So know that we're watching, know that your children, your grandchildren will turn to you and say, what were you doing? We knew we needed this. So what I would say is move and move in multiple ways. Because I get too many people I work with who are linear thinkers, and they're like, I need to do this first. No, you need to do this and then this and coordinate it and do it simultaneously. So I work with the Clean Energy Ministerial, and we're working on what are the workforce policies that we need so that we can have the uh, workforce prepared 
to do this inclusive clean energy transition. And we could have easily said, oh, we'll do a pilot with just two countries. No, we're working with 100 countries. And we are moving forward because that's what we that's what the planet needs. That's what our economies need. That's what the human beings need and the other species who are interconnected with us. So um, I'd say move. Now, you can prioritize what's going to have the most impact. And I could give you a prioritized list, but I'm not going to give you just one because it takes them off the hook. And they are on the hook in the history of humanity right now. Thank you, Dr. Rowe. Uh, so it looks like we have the uh, chat fixed. Uh, so uh, please copy and paste and send that out. Uh, Ernesto, uh, you know, like I said, we have talked about a lot of policies, uh, Congresses thinking about big wires and other uh, proposals. You know, what role does the public actually play in this process at, to make sure that Congress acts? That's a great question. And that is something that we've been uplifting, not just at CCAN, but different um, age, um, organizations uplifting the public's role. Um, uh, I uh, Russell earlier brought up FERC's office of um, the Office of Public Participation. And filing the comment is just as important as sending, if not more important than sending a tweet and urging our Congress people to appoint someone to a vacancy within FERC. Um, especially when we look at the tweet where we're bringing up, um, where we're bringing up the uh, proposed changes to the regional transmission cost allocation. I mean, we really, um, these changes and these changes to these rules really are aimed at like improving transparency, collaboration, and fairness in the allocation of transmission costs um, within a region. And then, um, and really kind of one of the things that us as members of the community, as members of the public, is really bringing awareness, not just to our community and not just to our elected officials, but raising those in those public comment periods um, within FERC, within whenever a uh, regulatory agency opens up those periods to provide those comments. Um, and it's not just necessarily us, um, one comment or two comment, maybe it's not as effective as hundreds if not thousands of comments coming in during those opening periods. Thank you, Ernesto. Uh, one final question before we, we wrap up here, uh, and this is gonna go to Harry. Um, since you have experience in Virginia and at the federal level. Um, as we know, Virginia is actually going through a, a, an assessment process of their transmission and interconnections. Uh, so uh, can FERC overrule any sort of state uh, policies related to interconnection and transmission? It's a great question. My instinct is, so FERC is given broad guidance in terms of interconnection standards. And, and particular rules, it gives a fair amount of discretion to states to ascertain, okay, so how are we doing particular cost allocations here? And I think going to the particular question in, in the chat, um, I'll be honest in saying I'm a little encouraged actually to see the commission talking about this because as it uh, as had originally been proposed by the utilities in, the com in one particular utility in the Commonwealth, all of those interconnection costs, including interconnection costs that are sort of dubious, like, is this really necessary to interconnect this? We're being thrown on developers and they were, they were killing project economics. And so having the commission actually stop and say, wait a minute, like what, what, what's really needed here? And then who should actually bear that cost out? I think is a reasonable process. If the commission comes away and it's unreasonable in nature, there may be recourse for injured parties to go before FERC and say, you have a set of rulings. And I'm thinking particularly here about something like FERC 2222 that's really about getting distributed energy resources onto the grid to say, hey, you should do it. But more often than not, this is something that's going to remain chiefly within the state venue. If the SEC makes a bad determination, there's certainly going to be an appeal to the Virginia Supreme Court based upon legal grounds rather than technical grounds, than there would be to FERC. So FERC would really be a backstop here. I sooner think that that's something that's gonna get resolved in the state. All right, thank you, Harry. Uh, so um, we are coming down to the last few minutes here. Uh, and I just wanna do a round robin of the panelists, just quickly 60 seconds. 
what is the one thing that uh, folks should take away from this webinar? Uh, we'll start with uh, Dr. Rowe. Uh, you can make a difference. Uh, it doesn't have to be a tremendous amount of effort. Remember, three people called. One senator changed his vote on a crucial bill. So the one thing, get involved. You got questions? Ask. We're here to help you. And you can make a difference. And it feels great. Way better than dooming and glooming to help create a more sustainable future for all. That's it. All right. Thank you, Dr. Rowe. Uh, Ernesto. Yeah, um, I think one one major takeaway, and it's something that we wish we had more time to expand upon, upon this, is really um, requiring transmission planners to assess the energy mix, mix, especially when we're starting to see the high penetration of renewables like solar and wind, um, and especially when the grid is kind of being tested. Um, that way we could assess um, project selection, especially when we're looking at this changing energy landscape um, and addressing those climate concerns. We've seen the climate test our grid over and over and over again, and we really need to assess our grid um, during those times to see how renewable energy could fill in those gaps and those voids as we start shifting and going towards that green energy revolution. Thank you, Ernesto. And finally, Harry. Uh, two things. Thing one, a full bench at FERC will make a difference. It will actually allow us to move forward on a number of rulemakings and a number of funds. So moving forward on that, putting forward the tweet that CCAN has, has given to everybody here, and then making certain that your lawmakers in the Senate are aware of that importance and they know that their constituents care about that. Because look, FERC's kind of a niche issue. Most people don't know what it is. That's really key. And then two, vote. There are elections in Virginia this November that will determine the balance of power in the Commonwealth. The progress we've made over the past four years there hangs on a thread. And then obviously there are elections coming up in 2024 that will be a big determinant about whether or not the progress we've made federally over the past four years continues or is rolled back. So vote. That's a perfect way to wrap that up, Harry. Uh, we'll certainly be talking about elections in the coming weeks. Uh, in months. Uh, so keep an eye out from SECAN's uh, uh, engagement on electoral work. Uh, but if you have any questions uh, for Ernesto or I, uh, once again, we've dropped our emails in the chat. Uh, thank you, everyone, for joining us. Thank you to the panelists for your great comments and helping us understand this landscape that we're in. Uh, we're going to send out this recording to everyone um, in an email, uh, and we're going to have further actions especially as we're coming up to common periods. We're going to keep everyone on this uh, list engaged because if you've shown up today, if you signed up, that means you care about this issue and we're going to keep you involved. So once again, thank you and a good night.